very much. The HIV pandemic has been with us for over 30 years now, and uh, we still not found a cure. We have, however, made very good progress in controlling the infection, and the way we've done that is to understand the HIV replication cycle. Um, and clearly, the best way of preventing the virus uh, from taking hold of a cell and hijacking its machinery is to simply prevent it from entering. And that's what our research has focused on. Back in the mid-1990s, two uh, co-receptors were discovered that were required for HIV to enter into immune cells. So there's a primary interaction between uh, C, um, uh, CD4 and GP120 on the virus. These are surface receptors. Uh, and then there's a secondary interaction with one of two co-receptors called CCR5 or CXCR4. And those uh, drag the two membranes together, allow them to fuse, and then the content of the virion can spill into the, the cell and, and hijack it. Uh, so what we've done is develop a single class of compounds that can simultaneously inhibit um, uh, entry by, that's mediated either by CCR5 or CXCR4. And we did this by, uh, by observing a region uh, in both proteins that appeared to be a common binding site. And we did initially a virtual screen uh, and found some commercially available compounds that we could test. And we found out that they did indeed inhibit both co-receptors. And then we used some synthetic chemistry to modify the structures, refine them, and make them more potent binders. So now we have compounds that are around 100 nanomolar in activity and pretty good selectivity profiles. So we are in the, um, the late portion of what we call the hit to lead stage in drug development. Uh, and once we've identified a lead, uh, then we have to do much more extensive profiling of the compound to see how well it works. The, the real opportunity here uh, is that since these receptors are receptors on immune cells, they're host, host proteins, and host proteins don't mutate like viral proteins do. So one of the great advantages we have is if we can get this to work, um, these compounds ought to pair up well with the other 25 or so FDA-approved drugs that all target viral proteins. And those are the ones that develop resistance. So we, we ought to be able to create um, uh, all sorts of new drug combinations uh, that could um, help to minimize the development of resistance. And then the other important point is that these compounds are uh, very easy to prepare. One of my students did a fabulous job in devising a, a really efficient synthesis of these. So they, they would be very inexpensive to produce, and this might have uh, some, uh, some consequences in resource-challenged environments such as uh, sub-Saharan Africa. I think I'll stop there. So the, the compounds are, they're, they're basically um, uh, three modules. Uh, there's a center five-membered ring aromatic compound uh, with uh, two adjacent nitrogens, and then there are two other compounds that, uh, two other um, uh, modules that hang off of them. Uh, one is an aromatic, one is a, typically a, a, a purpuridine module. And they're, they're very easy to make by this synthesis that uh, one of my graduate students devised himself, 
by the way. And uh, it, um, so we can make them in about uh, 40% overall yield in a couple of chemical steps. Uh, they, it's a telescope process, so, so a lot of things go on within the class, but we can do them all pretty um, efficiently. And again, as I said, we're trying to optimize the structure, but the synthesis that we have is modular, so it can accommodate a lot of different uh, components. Um, they, uh, we don't really, um, they have a, um, a whole series of signal transduction um, pathways associated with them. ECR5 has um, uh, several endogenous ligands, and most of these have um, uh, lead to um, expression of inflammatory proteins or proliferative proteins. CXCR4 is a fantastically interesting um, receptor. It's got a very complex signal transduction pathway. And um, one of the consequences of modulating it is chemotaxis. Uh, so it allows cell movement. Uh, so CXCR4 is considered um, to be represent 60% of the metastatic phenotype, for example. So when, when tumor cells migrate to another site, uh, a lot of that is modulated by, uh, by CXCR4. And it's, a, it's uh, in addition to HIV, it's a very um, interesting area, um, um, something we call chemosensitization. So there are a lot of groups, um, a lot of tumors for example, are um, um, inaccessible to drugs. Um, leukemia, for example, is bound tightly in the stroma around bone marrow, and, um, and the drugs can't reach it. Uh, so uh, one of the things you can do with these leukemic cells, which oftentimes contain CXCR4 on the surface, is you can use an antagonist that removes the ligand and they get released, and then they, and then you can use a second chemotherapeutic agent to kill them. Um, also, uh, a lot of interest in, in immunotherapy on this. Um, um, cytotoxic T cells can't access a lot of tumors um, that have CXCR4 with a ligand on it, and so if you use an antagonist, you can get the ligand to re be removed, and then the cytotoxic T cells can kill the tumor cells. So there have been some fantastic things going on, um, and uh, CCR5 doesn't have that many interesting therapeutic um, opportunities. CXCR4 certainly does you know, well beyond HIV. Uh, there's, a, there's a shared, there's a common binding site that we discovered, uh, and that um, uh, so we overlaid the backbones of the, the two proteins first, and it looked like there might be a similar region, and that's why we did the virtual screen. So a single compound could occupy a similar binding site in both proteins. Um, resistance um, uh, is intimately uh, intertwined with replication. So uh, you can't develop resistance unless you replicate. Right? So um, HIV um, replicates uh, 10 to the ninth times per day, uh, a trillion replications per day and one in every 10,000 replications leads to a mutation. Uh, so, um, so it's easy to see under normal circumstances where you're free to replicate, um, 
that uh, you can develop a lot of mutations very quickly. Uh, what it, um, uh, but you know, we always uh, we always say dead viruses can't replicate, so we, we like to kill them, and uh, uh, and we we also uh, if we can prevent the virus from entering the cell and hijacking the machinery so that the cell, instead of producing new immune cells, produces virions, we can prevent that. It's much easier to control. By itself, it's not sufficient, but uh, in combination with other antiretroviral agents, it, it, works, uh, it can work very well. Uh, but our job is to, with these compounds is to prevent the virus from entering. Thank you. So um, that, that's one of the great um, question marks. Um, we do have one compound, one FDA-approved compound uh, that works on CCR5. It's a Pfizer compound called Revera. And um, we can't, we don't like to use it by itself because um, uh, there's a selection process that goes on and over time, you start to select for the other CFCR4 virus, which is more virulent, and so physicians like to avoid uh, that process. Um, the, the big question with CFCR4 is, can we find compounds that are sufficiently benign to uh, prevent um, some of these complex signaling pathways from going awry, and only time will tell whether we're going to be able to find something. Uh, there's no problem if you, just in terms of finding an antagonist, a CFCR4 antagonist. Uh, we we've known how to uh, we've known about CFCR4 antagonists for 20 years, but we've never found one with a sufficient safety profile that it could be taken up every day of a patient's life. That's, that's the key. So these compounds at the stage that we're at right now uh, seem to have a very good safety profile. But we're early in the profiling process. So uh, we don't know if we're going to find later on that um, we can do this. One of the tests that one can do is there's a simple um, animal um, mouse model test um, for um, white blood cell mobilization. So I mentioned hemataxis is associated with CFCR4. So you can do this simple animal model test and see if you uh, see an increase in white blood cells. And if you do, I mean, that might be interesting if you're trying to harvest um, hematopoietic stem cells. But if you're trying to, to give it as an HIV therapy, that would be a red flag that would say, that uh, you know, you, you're probably not going to be able to use these compounds successfully because they're they're mobilizing a lot of things that you may not want to mobilize. So time will tell. So no to the latter, and um, uh, as I said, we're in the late stage of the hit to lead process. So usually, um, uh, when you find uh, it, might take us um, uh, several um, several months, another four to six months to find a lead, and then it could be. 12 to 18 months before we get into the clinic, um, unless we get lucky and, and, and move things along. And um, it's nice to dream about getting lucky, but most of the time you just have to turn the crank and, um, and uh, do the profiling that you need and all the, um, uh, the testing that you have to do 
to meet the um, uh, regulatory requirements uh, that uh, you need to file an IND. So uh, I'd say it, 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 it could be, if, if we were really lucky, uh, 18 months, and if it were normal, uh, 24 months, um, or forever, if we find a glitch that we can't control. Okay. 